Hello and welcome back to the Payroll Podcast. My name is Nick Day, CEO of JGA Recruitment Group. And today we are joined by Louise Bartia, Head of Delivery at Silver Cloud HR, and Charlotte Yardley, who joins me as Head of Partner Success at Sage People. And today we're going to be talking all about implementation, project lifecycle pitfalls, considerations, and best practice. Do stay tuned. We've got loads of resources as well that we're going to make available to you all at the end of the show in the show notes. It's one episode you don't want to miss. It's going to give you everything you need to make sure the next implementation you embark on runs really, really smoothly. Now, Louise, who joins me, is a CIPD qualified former HR generalist who has over 14 years experience across HR and HRIS project management. She's gained significant experience working on many HRIS implementations with several leading suppliers. And now, as head of delivery at SilverCloud HR, she supports clients to help them digitize their processes from sourcing new HR or payroll systems to designing bespoke services. We're talking about robotic process automation, self-service, artificial intelligence, data, and more. Basically, all the things that will help enable HR and payroll operations to become more strategic because they help empower people through technology. However, we have two fantastic guests to bring to the show today because we're also joined by Charlotte Yardley, who is Head of Partner Success at Sage People. Now, they really help knock down barriers in relation to information, insights, and tools that can enable payroll and HR processes to flow with ease. Now, I've known Charlotte for many years. She's Prince2 qualified. She's a principal project manager with extensive experience of managing teams of project managers to deliver full life cycle projects from RFI and RFP all the way through to hypercare. So essentially, whether you are someone who is thinking about embarking on an implementation project, or maybe you're midway through a project, or maybe you just want to upskill yourself to know and understand what it takes to deliver a successful implementation project, then this is one episode you absolutely want to stay tuned to right to the end, where I'll also be giving away a number of fantastic resources. So do stay tuned and you'll be able to deliver a seamless implementation. So without further ado, welcome Louise, or welcome Charlotte to the show. How are you both feeling today? Yeah, good, yeah. Thank you, Nick. Good, good, thank you. I'm gonna start with the basics. So if I'm an HR or payroll leader listening to the show right now, and I'm considering that implementation or digitization or transformation project, before I dive right into it, can you both sort of outline to me some of the key stages of what an implementation project might look like? Yeah, sure. So I think it's really important that when you embark on your implementation, you approach it in a really, really structured way. Um, most of the vendors uh, that will be implementing with you will come to you with a, a methodology um, and it's oftentimes unique to them. But broadly, it will follow um, one of four or five key stages. So the first stage is all about setting up your project, initiating it and really setting the, the cornerstones for success. So bottoming out how you will work together, um, having a really robust plan in place. Um, and making sure that you have the resources in place to make sure you have a, a, a successful delivery. Um, once that's uh, set in stone, and it's really important to spend some time focusing on that together with your vendor, you'll then move into what we often call discovery. So this is really where you start bottoming out exactly what you want your system to do and deliver for you. So your vendor will work with you to, to you know, explain how the system can deliver your processes and meet your, um, your organisational policy points. Um, but there's also the opportunity here to really think about how you're going to improve your, your, your current processes. So, you know, how you will move forward from where you are to do today and be more streamlined. So you'll workshop those together. Um, again, breaking it down into to topic areas um, all the way from from hire to retire. Um, and then once that's been documented, your vendor will take that away and ultimately build your solution. Um, at that point, this is where you really get into into the hard work um, as as a customer, because once that solution is delivered back to you, then you'll go through the process of testing. And this is key to really bottoming out what is working well and, and what isn't and making sure that that what actually is being delivered is what you're expecting to see. 
After you've been through that, if you have payroll in scope, you'll move into parallel running. Again, completely critical um, to the success of a project. If there is one thing that you don't want to get wrong in a project is paying people. It's quite emotive. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> really, really making sure that your payroll is on point um, and then moving into going live. And then the final stages and really what needs to be the golden thread all the way through your project is how you're communicating and engaging your end users. Um, I always encourage our clients to get uh, your wider stakeholders groups involved from as early as possible, have some representatives along the way who will work with you um, and will advocate for the new system uh, when, it, when it's time to go live. So uh, landing your solution well, communicating well um, and collaborating with the organisation all the way through will really mean that when your system goes live, um, it's well adopted and it, the, the end users have a really great experience. Um, so in a nutshell, those four or five steps really in a, a delivered in a really structured way means that you will have a really great smooth implementation from start to finish. Amazing, amazing. I mentioned the introduction, of course, there are going to be a couple of downloads. Some of those include, uh, we've got a, a link to a digital HR maturity model, which breaks through some of the things you've talked about. There's also going to be a link to an implementation common pitfalls and considerations PDF, which has been created by SilverCloud HR, which really goes into some of those subject points in a lot more detail. And we all know as well, of course, this this process starts a little bit earlier because there's a, you know, a job to actually help vendor select in the first place before we even embark on that solution. You've got a great white paper called 12 Steps to Selection White Paper, which we'll also make available. But it leads me to the point of, it's quite rare for me to bring two different clients into one show. So tell me a little bit about the collaboration between Silver Cloud HR and Sage people and, and some of the work that you're doing together. So um, with um, Sage, we have five um, Sage people partners, of which Silver Cloud is one of them. With our partners, we see them as an extension of SAGE. So we work really, really closely. So I work really closely with Lou and her team at Silver Cloud to ensure that they fully um, embrace and understand what it means to be a SAGE people partner and also live our values. And we work really, really closely with Silver Cloud because they do that vendor selection um, that you're talking about and they help customers with that, um, as well as um, having a section which also uh, implements uh, the likes of Sage people as well. So yes, we, we work really closely together on that. Awesome, it's great to see collaboration within the sector Regardless, and I think it's really, you know, a, a Silver Cloud, as you mentioned in the introduction, you work with a number of different vendors uh, to deliver different types of implementation. On the back of that, you've created a great PDF, which highlights some of the pitfalls and considerations that people need to consider in each stage of the, uh, the implementation cycle. I know that listeners listen to this now, whether you work in pay or whether you work in HR, they're going to want to know what some of these common pitfalls might be. So what are some of the common pitfalls and some of the considerations, perhaps the, uh, the, the people that are involved in the implementations or considering implementations right now uh, from a user perspective or from an HR leadership or payroll leadership perspective may want to consider? Yeah, absolutely. So obviously through Silver Cloud, we've delivered a lot of projects and, and had a lot of learnings along the way with different sides of organisations and different sectors. Um, but despite all of that, there are most definitely some common pitfalls um, that we see uh, that trend through all projects. And I think probably first and foremost is to really resource your project well. So sit down with your vendor and really understand what it's going to take to deliver a project. Now, having worked as a HR professional on the front line, so to speak, um, in you know in earlier years, have, and also delivering projects, I understand how how difficult it is to deliver the to deliver the day to day, but also to to really make sure a project's delivered well. Um, and oftentimes it's it's not impossible, but it is uh, too much. So if you can dedicate uh, time um, and skills and knowledge from your existing teams, um, or if you're standalone, uh, really carve out time in your day um, to dedicate to the project, it will make for all the difference in your success and the speed in getting your, your solution in for sure. 
Fantastic. Um, I, read, I read in the um, in your guide actually that actually it's the resourcing side, which obviously put my ears up as a recruiter, but actually <laughs> is often underestimated. So Charlotte, in your experience, where is where does this, this underestimated estimation take place? What are the things that are often overlooked when it comes to the resourcing piece in, in terms of time or, or individuals that maybe need to be drawn into a project? So I do think that um, some customers have a belief that they can implement the system along with their day job as well. And we know that the vast majority of people with their day job, they can be absolutely maxed. So it's really, really important that you get dedicated resource. And where we see it quite often, um, I suppose in terms of not having enough resource, is the project management side of it. Now, depending on what size your implementation is and how much you've got going on um, in your organisation, so it might be, so Sage people might form like a programme of work. Um, I think it really is important to have somebody who, who project manages um, the implementation. And I know, you know, we've lent on JGA a number of times for our customers where we've said, actually you guys can help in terms of bring that project management experience that they need for their implementation. Um, likewise, we ask for somebody who can dedicate some time to being a system administrator as well. And what that means is that throughout the implementation, they will become enabled on the system. And then after the implementation, they will be able to carry on administering that system because the last thing that we want is for a system to be implemented that you have to keep coming back either to Sage or Silver Cloud for ongoing help and support. Sure. Um, so we really recommend you have that system admin person in place and they become enabled throughout the implementation so that they can carry on um, administrating the system going forward. I think it's a great point. I think when it comes to project management, we see it and as, as a recruitment agency that a lot of people sometimes feel like they've got the skills. They don't necessarily want to hand them over to somebody else. They, well, I could project manage this, but we underestimate just how much work is involved and how much skill is involved in a project management process. So that must be something that I guess sometimes you have to come across and it's kind of educating to say, look, you've got enough on your plate already. We know that HR and payroll professionals are working, you know, tirelessly at the minute to do what they need to do in their day job. So to add that project management piece on top without necessarily that specialist skill sets required to drive it um, is always going to be problematic for the success of a project. I'd, I'd love to know what some of the other do's and don'ts might be that you come across. Maybe you've got some examples, Louise, where when you are coming into it or, or helping manage an implementation project, there must be some very standard do's and don'ts that you've, you've come across that maybe people have, have, have fallen foul of that listening to this. Yeah, definitely. Um... Don't underestimate your data. Um, so data is key to an implementation project uh, and it's very visible. Um, if you're an organization who has not yet um, you know, shared self-service with the organization, it, it's, you know, your data will be visible to, to the outside world once you go live. Um, it also comes down to the credibility of the people function and when it comes to reporting your data out, ensuring that that data is fit for purpose and accurate. So think about this as early as possible. Think about the data cleanliness, think about the data quality that you have, the completeness of your data sets. Now you'll get lots of help and support from your um, from your vendor um, in supporting you to, to get from A to B but you know your data best um, and you know your people best. So your best place to, to look at this. Um, and, it, and it really is uh, the success again to, to, to really making sure that when you go live, um, the solution is, is well received um, and people have trust in, in what's out there. So um, think about collating your data early. Think about your data sources and where you're going to collate that data from. Um, think about the time that it's going to take and the effort to go and uh, cleanse the data, but also to, to collate missing data. Um, I've been known to be in a filing cabinet at midnight at night, extracting contracts mm -hmm. to, to digitize that data. So don't underestimate the effort involved and the importance of getting it right from the beginning. It's really, really key. 
I think it's a, a brilliant point. They, you know, a lot of people say now that data is the most valuable commodity in the world, right? And we know that data is the one thing, the secret source, if you like, that's really helping drive the strategic importance, particularly of payroll, but HR is already there and utilizing it. But we know the importance of it now. If we leverage it correctly, it can be a hugely powerful tool in, in, in the success of, of a business if used, if used well. So presumably, the credibility of that data is absolutely imperative to make sure that's correct and it's all there and it's usable in whatever new system you're, you're bringing in going forward. I'd love to know some of the other lessons or experiences you've learned, um, Louise and, and Charlotte, in, in, in real client projects, I guess, that perhaps you've both been involved in, but have really, I don't know, where you can demonstrate a very smooth implementation or even where you've had to perhaps overcome problems to, to get something back on track. Maybe I'll start with you, Charlotte. So I, I would um, go to a point that you, um, Lee said earlier, which was about the testing. So... Um, really make sure that you know the scenarios that you want to test and base them on your business processes. So what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, at Sage People, we provide a, a set of testing scenarios, but they're ones to start off with and you need to build on those your business specific scenarios. So the customers that I have seen um, have a really successful implementation from the discovery stage where we talk about all your processes and what you want to get out of the system and how you want it to, uh, you know, cut down on your all your admin time and, and have really good processes. They then think about how they, they want to test that. And it's really important in terms of then when you get to the testing, um, stage that you go back to what you discussed on the discovery to say does the system do what I really want it to do because if you do that your system will land really really well but it will also become business as usual um, as soon as possible because people will use it and go yes this fits with our processes and how we want to work um, so I do think that's really key um, to a successful implementation as well. Absolutely. How about yourself, Louise? Any examples where, I don't know, you've come in maybe midway into, I don't know if you get involved midway into implementations, but there have been something where you've had to kind of get something back on track where there have been some problems to overcome and, and really, but, but it's, it's, it's resulted in a really successful outcome? Yeah, I think um, oftentimes one of the most overlooked elements and uh, in an implementation is around the, the, the change management and the communication around a project. Yeah. Um, it's really often overlooked and it's, it's, it's so important to get right and it starts from the day that the project starts as opposed to in the latter stages when most people think maybe we should start communicating about our new project. Um, so it's, it's always best practice to get a, a consultation group together um, who represent the business more widely, um, that involves your end users as well. Um, and in consulting widely about how the system will be uh, formed, um, what, what gets input into the solution itself, um, you start to win hearts and minds early on. And as I hinted to earlier, you begin to get your system advocates that you can uh, weave into your project as you, as you go. So Charlotte mentioned around the testing process. That's a really great opportunity to get some end users involved and upskilled early on um, so that they a help you test, but also start to 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 really talk about the solution and get people in their teams and in their um, you know, in their employee groups excited about what's to come. Um, and beyond go live, they'll also act as your, you know, your first port of call for anyone who's having issues in their teams. So really important to get them involved, communicate, get people excited about the solution. Um, it, it's a fine line about when you start communicating and what you start communicating. Yeah. Um, projects are always, always volatile, but uh, if you get that balance right, um, you will have a solution that embeds well into the business, lands well, um, and that people are accepting of um, and, and want to use and engage with. 
I think that's a, a brilliant point. I'm, I'm not an implementation expert by any means, but I've done a master's in professional consulting. And it was interesting when I did those studies, how much time we spent focused on managing resistance, change management, turning resistance into advocates, as you mentioned there, and how that can really help deliver a successful project of, of any, any guys, I guess. When it comes to resistance, what are some of the um, techniques or, or um, I guess, processes you might follow to try and turn resistance into advocates? And I imagine that must be something you come across quite regularly. Yeah, I think you. Um, it's always best practice to to understand your audience. So, so really understand who who you'll be engaging with, their involvement, their influence over the solution, <clears throat> and the process itself. Um, and communicate with them early on. Um, so understand what their resistance is, try to empathize with their position, um, and then by getting them the information they need, bringing them along with you on the journey of the implementation, slowly see if you can influence their position as you go along. Um, better to understand who, who is resistant earlier on, yeah that you can affect that change than to find out once the solution's live um, and, and that starts to cause issues. So um, communication is key in all of these processes um, and, and really stopping to think about where that resistance is coming from and most importantly, why as soon as possible. Sure, that makes sense. So going forward, what would you say have been the sort of key people, um, strategies, stroke initiatives, I guess, that, that your business have both been kind of driving towards, particularly over the last 12 to 24 months, we've seen you know, a rapid evolution in the way that, that people are now embracing new technology. So I'd love to know, in particular, perhaps some of the things that you've seen change and, and, and perhaps areas where Sage People, Charlotte, have helped support SilverCloud in, in that regard. So um, into, we have seen, obviously, we, with COVID, a huge amount of change about how people actually use their systems. So um, self-service in particular has been really, really important in terms of communicating to, um, to your team. So using uh, the communications page within Sage People to um, give them news, updates, um, also utilising surveys within Sage People as well to get a sense check and a health check of how people are actually feeling. So we've seen those parts of the system used far, far more um, than previously. Um, the other um, thing as well is reporting. So we've mentioned a few times now about data and having good quality yeah. data. So. Um, because people aren't working in offices as much, having um, the, the data and so things like absence data, where your team is, um, data on new hires and when people are due to start, having all of that data that can be reported, put in dashboards for managers um, and your team to have that complete visibility within the system has also been really, really key. So those are the areas that we've seen utilised more than ever, I suppose, over, over the last um, two years. Really interesting point you mentioned uh, visibility there, Charlotte, because I think one thing we've seen change in the world of recruitment is just how much transparency that em employees now demand. You know, we look at employees yes. now as consumers within businesses. They want to see more, but also people now, as you also mentioned, are working a lot more from home in remote environments. I'm assuming being cloud-based solutions, uh, Louise and Charlotte, that this hasn't caused too many issues in terms of delivering successful implementations because you can deliver things remotely now. But have you seen the process change in terms of how much transparency and visibility, to use your word, Charlotte, that, that clients and employees and consumers, if you like, are really demanding now? And has the remote aspect of it with the different stakeholders potentially being based not just anywhere in the UK, but anywhere potentially globally, has that caused any complications or has it actually done the opposite and made it much easier to deliver an implementation? Um, I would say a lot of Sage people implementations were previously delivered remotely um, okay. anyway. So we haven't seen so much of that um, impacted. Um, we have had, because it's a global solution, we have people based all over the world. Sure. Uh, during the implementation process um, anyway. But what I would say that we have seen uh, more of a demand for is 
uh, the mobile app and people how they access the system. Yeah. So they are more likely to use um, the mobile app. Um, you can set number of um, controls within the system of um, what tasks the manager does, what tasks HR does, and what tasks an employee does, a team member does. And around absence in particular, where a manager would book an absence before, we've seen more team members um, be able to book um, absences because every all of that data is collated and presented to the manager um, who then approves that data. So we have seen a lot more control given to um, the team members. And again, that the manager, HR, having that visibility um, through the system. That's great, because I kind of emphasised the trust piece as well, more responsibility, more trust, more visibility, all those things and what people are looking for now. So it's interesting to hear that kind of come back. So as a bit of a cheeky question, what are kind of the key business benefits a customer, you know, if a customer's coming to you that you would focus on if you're presenting, you know, a case to her, you know, they were looking to procure Sage and, and you want to give your your business case forward to them. What kind of things would you would you say to a customer? What, what kind of things would you focus on? Yeah, I think um you know, we've had a changing world in the in the past two years and uh, you know we are now truly global we've seen um, a shift towards uh, hybrid working remote working and you know that's where your solution really needs to work hard for you and be truly global and able to operate uh, in that way so you know we have now the concept of working from anywhere yeah. uh, and, and that's where a, a solution can not only uh, operate globally um, and give you global data, but also be able to, to manage local compliance. Um, we also see uh, that more recently there is a uh, more challenges in, in hiring individuals. So, uh, you know, a, a solution that is uh, engaging and also supports your employer brand. Um, so what we don't want is for you to to go out with a really successful uh, recruitment campaign to have found your your ideal um, applicants only for that experience to to reduce when they enter the organisation. So for example, onboarding tool sets, um, engaging uh, self service is really, really key to to retaining your top talent um, and embedding with them that they've made the absolute right decision to join your organisation. So, uh, you know, that then leads through to, to being able to, to feed back constantly. So, you know, we're now seeing a new generation enter the workforce. Um, their experience of the world of work is around personalization yeah. um, and uh, you know being able to see what they were sold matches matching um, what what the reality is um, so the ability to be able to offer that feedback day to day month on month um, through self-service through mobile is is really key um, to, to retaining top talent um, and having a, a successful solution that works hard for you. Absolute music to my ears, though. I couldn't agree more. I think um, we're always trying to explain to clients that the, the recruiting process doesn't finish when you find someone and make an offer. It's, you've got to get through that onboarding process, make the experience a really positive one, engage your employees, have that transparency, all the things you've just mentioned. And it's yeah. amazing how many clients do fall foul I guess they get that person in and they, they kind of forget or they don't have the training or, or the things that they need to make that those first few months and weeks a, a positive experience so um, I think the fact that you're addressing that is fantastic um, music to my ears I hope all clients listening to this do the same it's often a very much overlooked part of the recruitment process and uh, the experience certainly shouldn't finish once you've made that offer it's kind of the start really um, making that experience a really, really positive one. So, um, yeah, fantastic observation. I know we've talked a lot about data today, so I'd love to know if you've looked at some of the data that you've collected to know what you know what some of the successful outcomes you've been able to measure uh, working with Sage people. I don't know we've got any enhanced insights, or maybe you've got data in relation to improving processes. But any data or insights you can share with uh, with our listeners? Yeah, I think um, you know we've worked with lots of organisations who've really seen the business benefits of working with with Sage. Um, you know the the uh, the possibility of having uh, and being able to 
uh, express multiple brands in self-service is really key. So we worked with a, a leading education provider. They were part of a group and their individual brand identities within each of the group organisations is really important to them. So the ability to, to maintain that within Sage People's self-service was important to their employees and their engaging experience and their sense of being part of that particular organisation in addition to being part of the group. Um, we've also seen uh, again another group uh, organisational structure where uh, one of the group members um, implemented Sage People. It was such a success that uh, and delivered so much benefit to that organisation that now group wide they're looking to implement it globally. Wow, great. Uh, and you know, being a, uh, a PR communication organisation, um, seeing the benefits of, of having that engaging self-service experience and, and the mobile platform really, really was important. And, and again, aligned to, to how their organisational values and, and what they deliver as an organisation as well. Brilliant example. How about yourself, uh, Charlotte, in, in, in sort of collaborating with, with SilverCloud, have you been able to get some kind of insights or any, um, any data that's come on the back from your side where you've seen some really positive outcomes? Um, sorry, Nick, we're going to have to pause and think. Sorry, the, the, right. door was, the door was going as well there. So, I? Um, let me just pause and think a second. Um, it's a tricky one, isn't it? It is a tricky one. And Lou, you, you're absolutely brilliant, I have to say, <laughs> when you're talking, you're so natural. Well, this, this came, we, I can, yeah, we can scratch it out. I came um, from your side, I came in from Ben. Ben asked me, because you said you didn't get direct quotes to ask you both separately, so that's what I've done. But I can, if you want to yeah. give an example, you can, or I can move to the next question. Yeah, can you move to the next question? Is that okay? Just that, <laughs> I just think Lou's just answered that perfectly. That's fine. So, I yeah. just want to make sure I'm following Ben's guidelines, but that's all good. That's fine. Yeah, thank <laughs> you. We have Ben to blame, Charlotte. <laughs> that's fine. We'll roll it back. It's okay. Now, I have to say to all the listeners out there that Silver Cloud HR have created a fantastic digital HR maturity model. So, as I said right at the start of the introduction, this is going to be available to all of you to access in the show notes immediately after this recording. So, please do access it. Take advantage of some brilliant resources. Resources. But interestingly, within that digital HR maturity model, it talks about potential how potential customers can access the information to help plot their journey through the digitization process. It, it, it's a guide that states there can be numerous quick wins to be had at every single stage. So without giving the whole document away, what I'd love to know is perhaps whether you could share some of those quick wins for people that are listening right now, um, so what they might be, but also tell us a little bit more about the, uh, the model itself. Yeah, sure. So um, it, the digital maturity model is really key to us and it often helps us to articulate to clients um, and benchmark to where they are today to, to where they could be should they continue to digitise um, in the organisation. So we often ask uh, we often ask clients to, to to look at the model and honestly answer where they believe they are today. Um, and you know, we work with a range of organisations of all sizes: those who are offboarding from spreadsheets to filing cabinets to those who have digitised but maybe not necessarily landed it well, or their organisation is growing through acquisition or organically um, and they need to keep up with the demands. So by benchmarking yourself, that is one way for people professionals to, to also explain the, to the business in their business case what the benefits of digitising further can be. Um, it's visual, it's quick and easy, um, and you can see really by you know pushing forwards and digitizing further what the benefits will bring um, and how that can really add business value and you know greater return on investment. Um, I think again the pandemic has only shone a light on the benefits of, of digitizing, you know, the easy access to data. Um, if we're getting really smart about it, the benefits of, of you know, data analytics, um, predictive analytics, um, the move towards AI right at the peak of that yeah. model. Yeah. But even at the bottom, as we say, there are some quick wins to have um, and probably cornerstone to that, as we've talked about, is around your data cleanliness. Um, moving towards having some level of reporting um, in your organisation um, and being able to robustly get the data out and interpret it. 
So it, it's a really great tool to quickly see where you are, but also to aspire to, to the top of the pyramid um, and really help you drive the business case and articulate the importance of, of, of getting to the top or as close to the top as you can. Brilliant. It is a fantastic guide. I'm going I'm to um, reverse engineer this slightly then, uh, Louise, and put you on the spot here. Going, Taking yourself back to your your days as an HR generalist and when you're working in HR, let's, I know, pretending you don't know everything that you know now necessarily, but if you were embarking on an implementation project now and you were able to give one of you know, the, the best quick win, if you like, from everything that you know from that maturity model that would really help an HR professional listening to this now that just wants a bit of a, you know, a fast forward somewhere, what would be the, 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 the quickest win they could obtain from utilizing this model and from following a best practice implementation project? Again, data is king. Get your data accurate and complete um, and in a good position because that, again, is the cornerstone to, to everything. Um, you will be able to draw so many insights from having cleansed data, accurate data. And as we, again, we've talked about just the, the credibility that having good data has. You know, people need to be able to trust anything that comes after it in terms of the visibility of it, in terms of reporting on it. Um, you will not always be the owner of that data. So people own their own data. So encourage and instill in the organization the need to keep your data up to date um, and the benefits of doing so. And then collectively, um, if you then move on to implement a solution, or indeed if you're just reporting from, from your spreadsheets or, or your your uh, first solution today, at least then you'll know that what you're producing, people trust um, and you'll have the credibility from doing so. Amazing. We'll go back to that most valuable commodity in the world is now data. So uh, yeah, great point. How about for yourself, Charlotte, what would be the top tips you would give someone with all the experience you've got, not just implementing and project managing for lifecycle implementations, you've also project managed teams of project managers to do the same. What would be your top tips that perhaps people could take away from this episode uh, if they're in the middle of an implementation or they're considering one that could really give them a bit of a fast track? Um, I would um, go back to the change management piece. So look at um, who needs to be involved within the implementation, your subject matter experts, um, to the messaging that you want to land with um, the team. So really, really think about the people that need to be involved within an implementation. Um, get people excited about the implementation as well, because from when you first embarking an implementation, just looking for a system, let alone implementing um, Sage People to beyond, the amount that you are going to get from that is going to be huge. Um, so yeah, really, really quick tip is just look at the people that you need to get involved, carve their time out um, to what they need within an implementation from your subject matter experts right through to like the system administration side and project management side as well. Amazing. Now, of course, there is a, a brilliant white paper called 12 Steps to Selection. Um, if you are looking and you're at the early stages, this, this resource will also be available in the show notes. But I guess it's something perhaps we've overlooked a little bit so far in this show. So I wonder if there's any considerations, perhaps Louise, you would ask uh, a business a leader to consider if they were right at the start, they're just preparing to go to market for new HR or payroll solution. They haven't started the implementation yet. They're in that consideration phase. What are some of the things they need to think about? Yeah, having a really strong business case is, again, key. Um, think about it from the perspective of the business benefits as uh, as opposed to what we would naturally do, which is to looking at the benefits of the people function or indeed yourself as a HR leader. So really focus on, on what, what the business will benefit from and the return on investment. Um, think carefully about your scope and what, what you really need. So uh, what are the nice to haves versus what uh, is paramount for you to, to have in place? Think about um, not only uh, replacing or looking for like for like um, so that you're not reducing what the business gets, but also thinking about pushing some of those boundaries and, and what potentially the best technology you can get for your budget. Um, research the market. You can never do enough research. Uh, the, te the technology in the market and what's available today moves quickly. 
Um, you know, there are always evolving trends. Um, be clear on on how leading practice you want to be. Think about your organisational culture and what will work well. So, for example, if you're an organisation that may not be used to using um, technology, um, is a mobile led uh, solution always going to work? I would like to think that you can probably push the boundaries there and, and, yeah. and influence, but but do think about what would work and the best fit for you as an organisation um, is where we'd say. Uh, and then coming back to to having you know a clear plan um, on how you're going to go out to market and how you're going to procure your new solution, and again consult widely. So again, think about your challenges to to procuring a new solution, who they may be. Um, involve them early in the process um, and communicate um, and and gain people's opinions as early as possible as well. Amazing, fantastic. And you mentioned there as well, you know, that, that technology is moving really, really fast. So let's say I'm, a, I'm an HR or a payroll professional listening to this, and maybe I delivered a full scale life cycle implementation five, let's call it five years ago. Charlotte, yeah. what are the things that have significantly changed in terms of the process? that would make your experience five years ago, not necessarily give you all the skills you would need to deliver something now, which is why you might need some of that additional consultancy expertise, or you may need to get an external vendor involved. What have been the key changes in terms of the way that implementation delivery has shifted over the last five years? I would say that um, in terms of delivery, we're always looking at Sage at time to value. So what's yeah. the quickest, um, quickest return on investment that we can give you. So um, I would say processes have become more standardized so that um, companies can adopt those and um, bring in like some global standardization as well. So um, Sage People absolutely does cater for um, customers who have lots and lots of different entities and want each entity to have a different experience but what we would recommend um, is to have some global processes and some standardization we're seeing more and more of that than ever i would say over the last um, few years where um, thinking about the hr team and the people team that have to um, administer, administer systems do they want to do it for in lots and lots of different ways or do they want that nice standardized global process so that has has really changed um in the last in the last few years to to go with that more standardized approach excellent and so moving it forward then five years uh, louise we've seen you know technology change significantly over the last five years and evolve at such a rapid pace what are some of the things people are always intrigued to know what the future might look like and we know we can't we can't predict the future but if i was to ask you to give it a go how do you think technology in the world of payroll hr is going to change and evolve over over that well maybe that's five years is too long to look with the speed things are changing but what does the future look like it, it probably is at the pace that technology <laughs> is changing so um, I'm a huge advocate of thinking clearly about what your people strategy is needing to deliver in the next three to five years and then ensure, ensuring that your technology enables that. That's the way around it should fit. So yeah. um, if we think about some of the leading practice that's out there at the moment, that's really topical um, pay on demand, for example, where employees are able to draw down um, on their accrued pay um, immediately in, in the month. Um, if we think about financial well-being um, and the cost of living crisis that's uh, that's about to hit us, you know, having a really strong benefit election platform that will enable employees to see exactly what's what's available to them. Oftentimes we go into organisations and we ask employees, what benefits do you get and, and what's open to you? And, and, and sometimes they're unable to tell us, you know, what's available. So making that really visible, making pay flexible. Um, and again, thinking about the, the changing workforce, those who are now working remotely, uh, new generations entering into the workforce, I can, uh, I can envisage where AI is really going to, to come into self-service and deliver that personalised experience almost that um, you know, the, the new generation are looking for. 
Um, you know, we've all become accustomed to, to you know, uh, you know, TV platforms such as Netflix, for example, yeah. where algorithms are deciding what is presented to us. Self service um, people systems will go the same way. It'll become personalized um, as we move move forward. So there's some really exciting stuff out there. Um, again, organizations need to understand how ready they are for it and what fits with their culture and their needs. So aligning to your people strategy is really, really key to making sure that, you know, what you're moving forward with um, is fit for purpose, but there is some exciting stuff coming for sure. Yeah, it's a great response. We're living in an on-demand culture now, don't we? The, the streaming yeah. culture of everything's instant. And it kind of links to your tagline, um, although you didn't mention it, I'll mention it for you, which is kind of empowering people through technology rather than the other way around, which I think is a fantastic way to kind of to kind of round that off. Anything you would add to that, uh, Charlotte, in terms of how you're seeing the future of, of, of implementation and technology change? What are some of the, anything that you, you could add that, that maybe we haven't considered yet that people maybe need to start preparing for? Um, I would say Lou is absolutely spot on in, in what she said uh, and would wholeheartedly agree. Um, that analytics piece as well, yeah. but it's huge now, it's going to get even bigger um, in terms of what that data can, can give you in predictive analytics um, that it can um, give you in that all that insight of um, data that you can then, then work with. So, um, but yeah, I, I, I totally agree with Lou um, and her um, analysis of that though. So, yeah. Super. Totally agree on analytics as well. I, I say it a lot. It's obviously in the world of payroll, it's analytics. It's going to really drive that strategic profile of the payroll industry. It's already driving the strategic profile of the HR industry, and I'm sure it can yeah. continue to do so. So, uh, absolutely valid and, and worthy point to finish with. So, look, I'm going to open the vault. We're going to keep this short. Just two questions for you both. Same question for each of you. One's serious, one's a bit of fun, so do be prepared. And there's no pressure on your answers. But the first one then for you, Louise, um, if you could change the entire payroll or HR industry with one action or improvement, what would that action or improvement be? Without a doubt, um, accelerating pay on demand. Um, I can, you know, there, there is a uh, there is a two way conversation about the pros and the cons, but I actually see it's how we will all be paid in the future. Um, and being able to uh, have people think differently about pay um, and benefits is really, really key. So for me, pay on demand for sure. Fantastic. And the same question uh, for you, Charlotte, what action or improvement would you change if you could? Um, I would say get the experts in the right places. So make sure that you've got the relevant expertise, um, whether it be somebody that helps you with vendor selection, or whether we go, if we look at the resources side in terms of implementation, that project management piece that we said, um, make sure you've got the resource and those experts in the right places. Don't have somebody who feels that they have to do everything when you um, have got those experts to hand that you can call upon. Amazing. Couldn't agree more. Absolutely. And we've, we've identified as a payroll study recently, there's over 60 different payroll pathways now. It's becoming incredibly niche and payroll and HR professionals can't do everything. So I think that's Absolutely. a really, really good point. Absolutely well made. So last question, a bit of fun. Um, if HR and or payroll was either a movie or a song, Louise, you can pick either. Which movie and or song would you pick? Oh, Top Gun for sure, because we're all heroes in HR and payroll. <laughs> Boom, smash that out of the park. Excellent, amazing. How about yourself, Charlotte? Um, I'm going to say any of the Avengers movies, because you always need a team to be able to work with and uh, save the day with, I suppose. You can't just do it by yourself. So there yeah, you any of the Avengers movies. Superheroes as well, right? They're all superheroes. Yeah, oh, yeah, right. of course. Fantastic. Well, yeah. Louise Bartier, Charlotte Yardy, it's been an absolute pleasure for joining me today on the podcast show. Just to reiterate, if you haven't heard it already, you're catching this episode late. There are some fantastic resources I'm going to make available in the show notes. They include a link to the digital HR maturity model that we have discussed. They're going to include a link to the implementation, common pitfalls and considerations PDF that we've discussed as well. And there'll be a link to 12 steps 
to selection white paper, which are all fantastic resources. I highly recommend you take those, utilize them. Of course, do check out the website as well, which is silvercloudhr.co.uk if you want to find out more about uh, the work that Louise has been doing, or indeed if you want to find out more about Sage um, people, then of course you can go to sage.com as well. Both those links will be in the show notes. And of course, if you need support with any recruitment requirements, then you can contact myself or any of my team at jgarecruitment.com. Just leaves me to say a huge thank you to you both for joining me today on the podcast for the whistle stop tour to overcoming common pitfalls, thinking about all the considerations and best practice, uh, things that we need to consider when implementing or going through an implementation. So thank you so much, Louise. Thank you so much to Charlotte. I look forward to bringing you the next episode of the podcast real soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.